Okay, so thank you so much, Crystal, for being with us today. Crystal is a special needs financial advisor with Northwestern Mutual, um, so she'll be sharing some useful information. I will um, be monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions, feel free to enter them there, um, and we will leave room for some Q&A uh, towards the end of her presentation. Um, thank you again, and I will let you take it away. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so yes, thanks for taking the time to be here today. We're going to be touching on the topic of creating financial security for your loved one with special needs. So um, Ruby, let me know that there were several questions that kind of came in ahead of time. All of them were fantastic. I'm going to do my very best to make sure that the content we go through today covers all of the questions that you had. Um, but really, like I was telling Ruby, is the theme of today, what I really want to make sure um, you take away from this material is how to set things up in a way where we can keep these kiddos um, or, you know, loved ones eligible for their government programs throughout their lifetime. All right, I think that's the biggest thing. So um, let's kind of jump into it. I always like to start off by telling you a little bit about me so you have an idea who's going to be talking to you for the next, you know, 45 minutes or an hour or so. Um, but my name is Crystal. I live in Austin, Texas currently. I am a special needs mom. My youngest son um, is neurodivergent, amazing, so smart, so loving in a lot of ways, but not an easy child. Um, but that's okay. We love him. Um uh, I did grow up in Smithville, Texas. I guess our biggest claim to fame there is the movie that was filmed there years ago called Hope Floats. It's a good one. Put it on your list if you haven't seen it. Um, but a little bit more about me. I went to Texas State University and got a degree in business management. I've been doing financial services for 22 years, which sounds crazy to me that I've done anything for more than 20 years, but it's true. Um, 16 of those have been specifically in financial advising or financing. And when you look at my practice today, I work with a team. Um, we are fiduciary financial planners. So that means legally we have to do what's in the best interest of our clients. Um, and we do very comprehensive financial planning. I am the specialist on our team that works with families who have a loved one with special needs. So that's kind of my niche, uh, but, but we are part of like a, um, a big team. A couple of other things I'm proud of, I you know I just serve on an admissions board for um, a, a brand new residential community here in Georgetown, Texas. It's a wonderful community. I'm very excited about that. Um, if you are on this call and you're from Texas, you probably know we don't have a lot of great residential community options. So I'm just so proud to be part of this. Um, I'm also on the leadership team for a study group of financial planners from across the country um, who, who serve families who have a loved one with special needs. So what's great about that is no matter where my clients are, if you're in Florida, if you're in California, if you're in New Jersey, wherever you are, I have a team member that um, I can connect with who is you know, a specialist in, in your area. So we can definitely help no, no matter where our clients are located. And then lastly, the thing I'm most excited to brag about is my little family, right? Down The picture down at the bottom, my husband, his name's Irving. He's also one of my business partners. We met at work. That's how we met. Um, and then our two boys, Olivier, he's the one in the back. He's seven. He'll be turning eight next month. And then our little guy, Stellan, up in the front, he'll be six um, in September. And then there's our little, our little gal, Cassie. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, but I always like to start off with some interesting statistics. I'm a numbers gal. Um, I love numbers and I feel like there's a lot of, um, you know, comfort in a way that you can find from the data. And so these are some statistics that were from a survey back in 2016. It's a little dated, but my gut tells me it's probably not much different if we were to, you know, have updated numbers for 2024. Um, but let's let's start with the ones that I've highlighted here. So 82% of caregivers that were surveyed in this um, in this data collection here are concerned that they don't have enough financial resources to last their disabled relative's lifetime. 77% are concerned that they won't be able to retire. I'll tell you, I hear this one all the time. 
you know, I, I can't retire because I have to live forever and I have to work forever because I have to care, you know, for this person who might outlive me. Um, and I'm here to say that can't be the plan, unfortunately, because we can't, you know, we can't rely on that. We can't rely on the fact that you can work forever because physically you might not be able to. Um, but then 70% are believe that they will have to compromise their own retirement plans in order to provide for their dependent, meaning that they either have to work longer or live on less, right? Um, these are just some beliefs that, that are kind of out there. 87% um, are concerned about what will happen to their child once they're no longer living. This was actually a question that came through ahead of time from this group um, and absolutely something I want to make sure we address. I, you know, this is one that I think about a lot for our own family. You know, what's going to happen if I'm not here, right? Because um, there's a lot of mental load that kind of comes along with being a caregiver of and a, a person who has special health care needs, there's a, there's a mental load there and you almost kind of become irreplaceable. And so the thought of, oh my gosh, what happens when I'm gone? That is extremely daunting. A hundred percent can identify with that. Um, also 67% of parents have not set up a special needs trust. So this one is a really um, important detail. We're going to spend some time on that one today on what is a special needs trust? Why would you want one? Or do you need one, right? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but I, I find that number really interesting that it's so high, right? The 67% don't have that one piece set up. And then the last one, only 23% of families have a formal financial plan for their dependent. And only 37% are working with a financial advisor. So what I take away from that last bullet is really eye-opening for me. That means only 37% of people have counsel that they're seeking to help them with any financial matter. And of those, 23% um, are addressing the dependent with a disability. So again, I'm a numbers girl. What I take away from all of this, when I look at it as a whole picture, is there's a lot of moms and dads and caregivers, maybe, you know, that are probably not sleeping very well at night because they have all of these thoughts and fears kind of running through their heads of I'm going to have to work forever. I can never retire. Like what's going to happen when I'm gone? Um, you know, and not a lot of help, right? There's not a lot of help out there. So my goal for today's session is to do my very best to create some clarity for you all on the process, how it works, and some direction on where to get started, no matter where you're at in your planning journey. If you've got everything all buttoned up, awesome. If we're at the very beginning, we haven't done anything, that's great too. My goal is to get you um, the information to, to take the next step, whatever that might be. So that's what we're gonna try to focus on today. Um, okay, quick agenda. Um, two main topics we're gonna to focus on, building out your team and then developing your special needs plan. So let's, let's jump into building your team. We believe that you're likely going to want to engage with these three professionals throughout your journey. So the first would be a financial professional. That would be someone like myself, um, a government benefits specialist, and then lastly, an attorney. And you, you may notice that it says an attorney experienced in special needs trust. Um, occasionally, I'll have a client tell me, um, oh, you know, I don't have a will or a trust set up yet, but I have an uncle or a cousin who's an attorney and they said that they would do it for me for free. And I'm a bargain girl. I love a bargain. If you can get me something for free, yes, please. Um, however, when it comes to the special needs trust, that is where I would suggest you seek someone who actually has some experience in that because it is a very specific document that has specific language that if it's, if it's not drafted correctly, can either disqualify benefits in the future or create a massive headache for whoever's going to be a trustee at some point in the future. So you just want to make sure that piece is done correctly. Um, but let's kind of talk a little bit more in detail about the role of each of these team players. Um, let's start with the attorney. So the attorney will typically come into the process for you 
um, at the point that you want to um, receive some type of a legal document, right? So you will engage with them and it's typically a one and done type of a relationship. It's not usually ongoing, um, but what that attorney is able to help you with is setting up a will, getting powers of attorney set up, um, setting up guardianship, if that's something that's needed um, at age 18, and then certainly setting up the special needs trust, right? So the actual legal document that you're going to need to have comes from the attorney. Um, now, the financial professional, um, it's always hard for me to describe this one because I can't speak to what every financial advisor does for their clients. Um, my gut tells me most financial planners can help with the first two parts of this piece here, which is the protection and the gross, growth part of planning. Um, so that would be things like setting up life insurance, long-term care, helping you with your savings goals, retirement, you know, investing, setting up for college, all of those kind of things most financial planners are able to help with. But if you're on this call today, um, my gut tells me you're going to need some extra planning. You know, it, it may go above traditional type of financial planning, and that's going to be that legacy piece there. And with the legacy piece, um, there's really kind of two components to it. Estate, excuse me, estate equalization and then trust funding. So with estate equalization, this comes into play when we have a family who has multiple children. And if let's say one of them has a special health care need and is going to need lifetime support, but maybe the others don't, then we have to be very strategic on how we set things up because what we don't want to do is leave everything to the child with a special health care need and disinherit everyone else. Um, and we also don't want to leave everything split evenly across the board because we don't want to leave anyone out, right? I hear this one all the time. Um, but by that strategy is probably not going to work either because we might actually not be allocating enough to our loved one with a special health care need. So we have to be very specific there, right? Um, making sure that we're fair, but also equitable um, in the inheritance part. And then the trust funding strategy, this is also very important. I think by the end of today, you're going to understand why you probably want to have a special needs trust. But in addition to having the trust, we want to make sure we also have a funding strategy for it, meaning that we know almost down to the penny how much needs to go into that trust to make sure that our child or our loved one has the resources that they're going to need throughout their lifetime. Right. So that's the extra piece, the legacy part. That's going to be crucial to your personal planning. Um, the, the first two parts also important. Right. We can't just look at one part of the plan in a vacuum because then everything else is going to be left to chaos. Right. We have to look at it holistically, look at everything across the board. But the legacy piece is going to be very important um, in your planning. Um, let's move on to government benefit specialists. So this person um well, let me just say this. I work with a lot of families who have children that are already in adulthood and either mom or dad has become a government benefit specialist themselves um, by default, right? They've applied for benefits. They got declined. You know, they made all of the mistakes and learned from them. And so they could probably make millions by writing books on what to do and what not to do when applying for government uh, benefits. Um, I'm here to tell you, you can absolutely go that route. You can definitely do this portion on your own, um, but there are professionals out there that can help assist you through this part of the planning process. And that would be at the point that you're ready to apply for programs like SSI or SSDI, which we're going to talk about in more detail here in just a moment, um, but also any applications for Medicaid, any state or local programs that have maybe Medicaid waivers um, all of that, you know, you have to send in paperwork for and apply for, and it, it can be very tedious. So if, you, if you're the type of person who says to yourself, I don't have the time or the mental capacity, because I feel like that's me, mental capacity is a big thing, right? Um, if I don't have either of those things, then um, I'm going to maybe delegate that to someone else who can help me. So there are people out there that can do that. Um, hopefully that's helpful. So those are the three professionals. Um, quickly, let me go over when they come into the process. Attorneys will come in at the point you engage with them. I would say if you haven't done this yet, sooner than later, 
would be best. You want to get that kind of kind of buttoned up sooner rather than later. Um, I also recommend that you review those documents every five years um, because you are going to designate um, positions, if you will, to certain people, whether that's a successor guardian or a trustee or an executor, right? All of these things. And in five years time, things could change and you might want to update that and, and select different people. So I always recommend every five years. Um, in addition to that, ability levels could change, right? I mean, we might have, we might get to a point where we're seeing significant gains and maybe we um, don't need access to government programs anymore. So then that would be a reason why we would probably want to revisit that those estate plans. The financial professional, this is the only relationship that is typically ongoing, where you will meet with this person at least once a year to review things, make adjustments as needed. And then the government benefits specialist typically comes into the conversation around the age of 18, um, because that's when a lot of those government programs that we can apply for um, will come into play. So hopefully that was helpful on the team, where they come from. Now, the little box down at the bottom, the other professionals and resources, I feel like the parents that I work with, we do a great job of figuring this part out, right? Because this is the, the box that we have to have to get through the day. The doctors, the therapists, the teachers, um, you know, the public and private programs that our kiddos are a part of, all of that. Um, we've probably done a good job of figuring out that box, but I find a lot of times when families come across my door, they don't have connections with those top three boxes. So if at the end of today's call, you have questions, or if you'd like to get an introduction to an attorney or a government benefit specialist, um, I'm happy to, to make an introduction for you. Okay, we're moving on. Let's talk about government benefits. We'll start with SSI, um, also called Supplemental Security Income. So I always get a lot of questions about this particular benefit. <clears throat> and usually the question is, you know, do I qualify? So let's kind of talk through that. Let's start at the bottom of the slide here. If we're talking about a child who's under the age of 18, um, and you're wondering, do we qualify for SSI? It's a bit complicated because when you apply for this benefit, they're going to look at parents' income and parents' assets. In addition to the overall household size, and that's how they're gonna determine eligibility. So if we have a family where we have one or both spouses working, it's actually pretty hard to qualify for SSI when your child is a minor. It's not easy. The income threshold is actually pretty low. So, you know, it, it's it, it's not easy, I would say, to qualify when your kiddo is a minor. Now that said, when your child turns 18, the equation changes a bit and they're not gonna look at mom and dad's income or assets anymore. They're just going to look at your child's income and assets. And so this is the part where we have to be very careful because as of today, the asset limitation is $2,000. So if we wanna make sure we're staying in compliance and, and eligible for SSI, we can't have more than $2,000 of any type of asset in the child's name where I see this kind of where we get hiccups sometimes is where mom and dad did a great thing when kiddo was little and they set up a checking or savings account in the kiddo's name, you know, and they've been putting birthday money or holiday money in this account over time. We've got several thousand dollars in there and it's for their future. It's a wonderful thing. However, if you were to apply this to, for SSI, they're going to ask you on the application you know, to disclose that. And if we disclose it um, and it's over 2000, they're gonna decline the application. We can't have more than 2000. Um, another place I've seen this is where, um, I'm just thinking of a specific instance where a grandma in her will left $5,000 to all of her grandchildren and listed all of the grandchildren's name independently. And we had a, a, an individual that was receiving SSI and received a $5,000 inheritance. Well, that put him over the $2,000 limit. And so we were off benefits for that week, or excuse me, for that month. So um, that's just one of the, the big ones we have to keep an eye out on is that $2,000 
um, asset limit. Now here in just a minute, we're gonna talk more about um, ABLE accounts and we're gonna talk about special needs trusts, which are kind of the answer to that problem, right? Because if you're thinking, well, how are we gonna make this work um, if we can't have more than $2,000? Well, the ABLE and the special needs trust are kind of gonna be that answer. Um, but what is SSI? What is the benefit? As of right now, it's $947 a month. And in addition to that, if you qualify for SSI, there's also automatic acceptance into Medicaid health benefits if, if the individual is not already receiving that. Um, so what's wonderful about this program is we can almost always depend on some level of income and some level of health care you know, throughout the lifetime if that's what's needed. Um, but there is that asset and the income limitation. Now, the income limitation is, is also kind of complicated. Um, any money that the recipient earns independently is going to be, there's a calculation and there's a deduction from the benefit. But if the child receives even $1 of SSI benefit, then they're still going to be eligible for the Medicaid health benefits, which is huge. I will say for a lot of my families where the children are over age 26, oftentimes the families find the Medicaid health benefits more valuable than even the $947 a month, um, you know, income that they get from this benefit. So hopefully that was helpful. I always get a ton of questions about this. So if you have more questions, pop them into the chat. I'll definitely make sure we address them at the end. Um, unless there was one I need to address right now. We do have two questions. Okay. In the chat. Yeah, let's do um, it. Is the 529 contribution included in the 2K limit? Great question. So 529 is a tax code. And if we're talking about a 529C, which stands for college, um, or a 529A, which stands for ABLE, um, either way, the answer is no, it should not. If it's a 529 college account, then technically the owner of the account is mom or dad or some third party person. And the beneficiary of the account is the child. So if it's arranged that way, then it won't be an issue. Um, now then the 529A, the ABLE account, we're gonna spend a lot of time on that here in just a moment, but again, no, that will not count against them in the uh, compliance for SSI or Medicaid. Great question. Yeah. Um, the next question is um, the social security worker told the family that social security goes off parents' income until the recipient is 19. Interesting. That must be a state specific um, thing. Generally, it's 18. Um, it's usually the month after the 18th birthday. I'd be curious to know what state that is. Um, yeah, but that, that's pretty unusual. From my experience, it's age 18. It's in Kansas. In Kansas? Mm -hmm. Let me double check because I have a really great partner that I work with in Kansas. I'll, I'll definitely follow up with her and I can email um, you, Ruby, and, and follow up on that. That's good. My gut tells me it's 18, though. I'm pretty sure it's 18. But you could be right. I, I tell you, I, I am an expert in this field, but I still learn every day. There's always these little things that, you know, I learn every day. But I will definitely get you the answer on that for Kansas. And then one more came oh, up. Sure. Um, sure. And it's what is the difference between SSI and SSDI? Well, it's almost like I paid that person for the segue because that's our next slide. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. So um, SSDI is another really great program that we, we can get from the government. Um, sometimes it's called RSDI. You might have heard it inter interchangeably, but it's essentially the same type of benefit. Um, and the way that this one works is this benefit is generally going to be tied to mom and dad's social security retirement benefit. So at the point that mom and dad retire and they start drawing their own benefit, kiddo is going to be entitled to their own separate benefit equal to half of the hire of mom or dad. That's a lot of words. So let me give you an example. Let's say that I'm retired and my social security is $3,000 a month. My husband's is $2,000 a month. Okay, so to collectively we're getting 5,000 a month. My son would get half of my benefit since mine's higher. 
So he would get $1,500 a month. That would be what his benefit is. Um, <clears throat> now there's a couple of caveats to this, right? So we have to make sure that we have a, dis a disability diagnosis prior to age 22. So that would need to be um, medically documented, right? 22 is kind of the age limit for this particular benefit. Now, if we fall in that, in that category, great. I get a lot of questions though about um, what if my child had their own working record? Do we have to claim on that? And the answer is you can, um, you can claim on theirs if theirs is higher than yours, but you don't have to, assuming we have that um, disability diagnosis prior to age 22, right? So we can always go on mom or dad's record, whichever one's higher. Um, another question I get asked a lot is, do these benefits stack? So if I'm getting SSI and we start getting SSDI, do we get both? Um, and the answer is probably not. Um, and the reason why is because there is a calculation. They're always going to make sure that you have at least the $947 a month that you would have gotten from SSI. But if the benefit from SSDI is more than that, then we're no longer eligible for SSI. That will go away. Um, and so usually the next question I get asked is, well, well shoot, if, if SSI goes away, what happens to Medicaid health benefits? And so... What generally happens there is there's a two year kind of grace period where you stay on Medicaid. And then after the two year grace period, um, the child would switch on to Medicare health benefits and they, they can keep that forever. Which in my opinion um, is actually a great thing because at least in our area, I've found that there are many more providers that will accept Medicare insurance versus Medicaid. So we, we, you know, we can have access to maybe some some different type of healthcare providers. Um, so that's kind of how the health benefits are impacted. The other question I always get asked is how long does it last, right? How long do they get to keep the 50%? What happens if I die? Um, and so kiddo gets 50% indefinitely. When you pass away, then it actually bumps up to 75% and they keep it at that level for the rest of their lifetime. Yeah, so, so that's kind of the difference between SSI and SSDI. The other thing I'll say about SSDI is it's much more um, flexible in that we don't have that asset um, or income or, um, limitation, right? So there's it's much more flexible in that regard. However, um, if your kiddo is receiving any type of Medicaid waiver um, at all, then we're going to have to stay in compliance with that $2,000 limit rule. So I always encourage my families because they they kind of think, oh, once we get to SSDI, you know, maybe we don't need the trust anymore. We're we're good, um, but that's probably not true if we want to have access to any type of Medicaid waiver down the line. So it, it's my opinion you want to just make sure you set things up to where we can always stay in compliance, whether we need these benefits or not. We at least have the capacity to still stay eligible for them. Um, I guess let me ask you, um, Ruby, are there any questions about this one that I can maybe touch on before we move on? No more questions at the moment. Okay, perfect. If you guys think of a question, though, about this one, definitely pop it into the chat and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, I think I hit on the, the big ones that I always get questions about, but okay, we're going to move on. Let's talk about developing your special needs plan. So... <laughs> you know, we just spent a little bit of time talking about those government benefits, you know, what they provide, how they work. Um, like I said, SSI, Medicaid, any of the Medicaid waivers to stay in compliance, we have to be under the $2,000 limit rule. So where this becomes a challenge is when we have mom and dad leaving their estate to the next generation, right? If, if mom and dad pass away and now we have this estate coming down the line, how do we leave that to our child in a way where they can still stay below the 2000? And the special needs trust is the answer. So, um, you know, sometimes people will ask me, you know, do I need to set money up or, or put money into the trust right now? And I would say that's a great question for your attorney, but um, in my experience, nine times out of 10, probably more than that, actually, the trust is actually... Um, set up through the will. So the will will say, and I'll use myself as an example, 
if something happens to me, everything goes to my husband. If something happens to him, everything comes to me. But then if something happens to both of us, a trust will be created at that point for our son. Technically, we're going to have two trusts created because both of our children are minors at this point. So we're going to have just a child, a typical child's trust set up and then a special needs trust set up for each of our two boys. Um, and then at that point, whatever assets we plan on leaving to the trust, we will list that as the beneficiary on the account, right? So where you might see that is if you have checking or savings accounts, retirement accounts, investments, life insurance, that's a really great way to set up or to fund a special needs trust is with life insurance, all those different things. Once, once your trust is um, designated through your will, then you can list that as the beneficiary or contingent beneficiary on those accounts. Hopefully that made sense, but that's kind of logistically how it works. The trust is established upon parents' death. And then we already put trust in accordance to the will um, as a contingent beneficiary. And so it all just happens at the same time. Now, the reason why we would want to set it up that way is because that, that keeps the money or the asset, whatever it is, from flowing directly into the child's name. It'll never go through that their name, right? It goes straight from mom and dad or whoever, grandma, grandpa, into the trust. And we can stay in compliance for government benefits. Hopefully that was helpful of kind of what it is, um, why we might want one. Um, but let's talk about one of the things that you'll need to kind of think through as you're setting up your special needs trust. And that is naming a trustee. So I always get questions about what's the difference between a trustee, an executor, a guardian, right? You, you hear these things and sometimes people think that they're interchangeable roles um, and they actually are very separate and specific roles that you will want to designate, you know, through your estate planning documents. But the trustee is a very important person and that is the person or entity that is in charge of the of managing the assets um, or, or anything related to the finances, right? So they're going to be making maybe investment decisions. They're going to be paying bills, filing tax returns, all of the things related to finances. That's what the trustee does. Um, one of the things I would encourage you to think through is when you're when you're deciding who you want your trustee to be. Make sure it's someone who understands the rules of the game of staying in compliance for government benefits, because, you know, we spend as parents or caregivers, we spend a lot of time compiling, you know, information on how to do this thing right. And it's a it's a complicated system. And so just imagine being thrust into that role of being, a you know, a, a trustee for someone's a state or for their trust, not knowing any of the rules of the game, right? That would be a very big responsibility. So just make sure they understand a little bit about how that part works. Um, and when you're thinking through it, you can choose a family member or a close friend. I can tell you, we help manage several um, trusts where it's a sibling who's the trustee, right? So it's a sister, brother, um, paying the bills, filing tax returns, doing all the things, right? And reaching out to us to help with the investment portion. Um, certainly a great option if it's someone who's close to the to the child, right? Um, you can also choose a co-trustee arrangement. So that would be where you have more than one person. So maybe you have a sibling and maybe a family friend, right? Where I've seen this work really well is where we have a, a family member who's close to the individual and then maybe the, the second person is someone who does have some experience in either investment management or understands how trusts work or understands how what the rules are for staying in compliance for government benefits. So they, they bring kind of like a level of um, business know-how to the conversation. So I've seen that as a good arrangement. What I also like about this one is that there's a checks and balances. So we no one's ever going to come you know, and buy a Ferrari from a special needs trust in this scenario, because I'm guessing the other person would say, 
you know what, I don't think we need a Ferrari. I think we could probably find transportation in a more reasonable way, right? And so both people would have to sign off before a purchase was made in this arrangement. Um, and then the third one, the third party corporate trustee uh, arrangement, this is actually a pretty popular one for a lot of the clients we work with. Um, this is a trust department or a bank, right, where they have employees who that's their job is managing trust. That's what they do all day, every day. They get continuing education on it. You know, they sit through lunch and learns to understand how things work. So that's their job. Um, there is a fee for this, but if if I'm working with a client and they just feel like they don't have a family member or a close friend that they, they feel like they could trust with that responsibility, then the corporate trustee is a really great option. So um, hopefully that was helpful. As if you haven't set up your you know, estate planning documents yet, before you go into that conversation with the attorney, you might want to kind of think through who do we want to, to be the trustee. Um, now, what is a trustee versus a guardian? Okay, so the guardian is the person who makes decisions for the person themselves, right? So they might decide where they live. They may make medical decisions for the person, um, but they actually don't have any legal right to the financial piece. Those are separate roles, right? Now, it could be the same person, though. So again, I'm thinking of an instance, one of the families we work with where we're helping managing the trust Sister is trustee and guardian. So she's got full kind of control and power over the whole the whole thing. Um, but they could be separate people. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, I'm going to move on and let's talk about ABLE accounts because I always, people have lots of questions about ABLE. So um, an ABLE account is a really great way to save money now for your kiddo, for their future. Um, in a way that's not going to affect Medicaid eligibility or SSI, right? So um, Congress authorized these. They're, they're available state by state, and they create tax-free savings accounts. So I mentioned earlier 529 is kind of a tax code. A 529 college account and a 529 ABLE account are taxed the exact same, meaning that we can invest money now and it'll grow tax-free and then we can pull it out tax-free. So we never pay tax on any of the gain portion, which is really wonderful. With the 529 college account, there's some restrictions on what we can use the money for, right? We can only use it for education related expenses. In an ABLE account, we can actually use it for education related expenses in addition to a lot of other things. So it's a much more flexible, um, account, we can use it for many more things than if we just leave it in the 529 college account. Now, if you already have a 529 college account set up, you can actually transfer it over to a 529 uh, ABLE account. You can just transfer it over. Um, we have a lot of clients that will do that, that maybe set accounts up when their kiddos were little and then circumstances change it, changed and maybe kiddos not planning to go to college anymore. Um, don't worry, that money's not stuck or locked away forever. You can actually transition it over to an ABLE account um, and we have access to it again. A couple of things to keep in mind, though, if we're trying to stay in compliance for SSI and Medicaid, then we you can't have more than $100,000 in this account at any given time. So that's the limit, $100,000. Um, now, if you're wondering what are the eligible expenses. What can we use this for? It can be used for anything that's going to create a better life experience for the beneficiary. So really that's, I, there's not many things I can think of that wouldn't fall under that umbrella, right? Anything that's going to create a better life experience. So that's certainly education, housing, transportation, preventative wellness, anything health related, anything related to the diagnosis, um, financial management and administrative services. It can pay for a financial planner. Um, it can pay for an attorney. Um, expenses for oversight and monitoring if we need to, to hire a private paid caregiver, something of that nature, certainly use it for that. You can use it for funeral and burial expenses up to a certain amount. I believe it's 10,000. Um, again, you might wanna just confirm that based on what state program you're doing, um, but I believe it's, it's 10,000. And then you can use it for basic expenses like food, right? 
So I will tell you this, up until September, as of right now, if we have a child receiving, an adult child receiving SSI, um, they are technically not supposed to have any type of additional support to help pay for housing or food, whether that's a parent helping subsidize it or if it is a, a trust helping subsidize it. If anyone is helping support those two budget items, then the SSI benefit is reduced by a third. So instead of getting 900, we're getting 600, right? So this is a problem because if you, I mean, no matter where you live, but certainly if you live in central Texas, you can't live on $947 a month and pay for housing and food. It's impossible um, unless you're living at home with mom and dad, which if that's the case, that's fine. But if we're looking for an independent type of setting, it just doesn't work. And so that we were, you know, a lot of families are, kind of stuck there. Now, if we have funds in an ABLE account though, we can use it to pay for housing and food and it won't count against us for SSI. So where we see, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, um, but, but this is kind of a workaround to that rule. Now I will tell you as of September of this year, that rule is changing and food will no longer be an issue. So, I mean, technically before, if you took your kiddo out to celebrate their birthday for lunch, you were supposed to report that. And next month on their SSI check, it would be deducted by however much you paid for their, you know, steak birthday dinner. I mean, it was wild. So that has changed. That's going to be going away in September. But the housing is still going to be something that has to be tracked and, and monitored. So an ABLE account, in my opinion, works really well in connection with the special needs trust, particularly if we're needing to stay eligible for SSI. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, do we have a question? We do have a question. Um, okay. can, a ha can a child have more than one 529 account, either 529C or 529A? Great question. Um, that You can only have one 529A. You can only have one 529A. Um, you can have a C and an A, I see that all the time where we're working on transitioning college money over to the ABLE account. Um, and, and I don't believe there's a limitation on how many college accounts you can have set up, but you can only have one ABLE account. So yeah, hopefully that answered that question. This is my favorite slide of the whole presentation because this shows you in a side-by-side -side how an ABLE account is different from a special needs trust and how they're the same, right? So. Um, let's start with eligibility. <clears throat> As of right now, to be eligible for an ABLE account, we do have to have a disability diagnosed um, prior to age 26. This rule is actually changing. I believe it is in 2026, it's moving up to age 46. But as of right now, it's 26. We have to have that um, documented disability. For a third party special needs trust, there actually is no age limit, right? So if we never have anything documented, that's fine. Or where I see a lot of times with tra traumatic brain injuries, if it happens later in life, um, that's not gonna be an issue here. We would still have access to that third party special needs trust. In terms of setup, an ABLE account is very easy to set up. Um, here's what I would encourage you to do um, well, as part of registering for this event, we're going to send you several tools. One of the tools I'm going to send you is what's called the ABLE Analyzer. And here you can look at all of the 50 state programs that are available, and you can kind of weigh the pros and cons of each program. What I will say is if you live in a state that has a state income tax, you absolutely want to participate in your state's ABLE program because you'll get a deduction for it. However, if you live in a state that doesn't have a state income tax, then you know you don't have to do your state's program. You can kind of look around and decide if there's a de another state's program that you prefer because all of them are run just a little differently. Some of them have access to debit cards, some don't, some have checkbooks, some don't, some charge fees if you go over a certain amount of transactions, right? So they're, they all work a little differently, but that ABLE Analyzer tool really makes it simple to compare and contrast each program. 
Um, but again, if you have a state income tax, absolutely do your state's program. Um, but you can do that on your own, right? You don't have to go through an attorney or a financial planner to set up an ABLE account. You can do, you can go directly to, you know, if you wanted to do Texas ABLE or if you wanted to do um, California ABLE, you just literally Google that and it'll, it'll pop up and you can open the account online. Um, however, with a special needs trust, you definitely want to go through an attorney for that. Again, someone who has experience in, in doing the special needs trusts or elder law, they're kind of similar. Um, so you would need a, an attorney for that. In terms of contributions for an ABLE account, the maximum you can do each year is 18,000. And that's total. So that's where it's a little from a college account because in a college account, it's 18 per contributor, right? So technically I could put in 18, my husband could do 18, grandma could do 18 for a college account. If it's an ABLE account, that's not true. It has to be 18 total. Now, if the kiddo is working um, and creating their own income, that, that number changes a little bit. But I think for today's session, just remember the 18,000 is the limit. Um, in terms of a special needs trust, there is no contribution limit. We could put $18 million in there and that's perfectly fine. There's no limit on that. Um, for account balance limits, for an ABLE account, like I said, 100,000 is gonna be the limit. Otherwise we have to count it as an asset for SSI or Medicaid. Um, so 100,000 is the limit there. Special needs trust, no limit. In terms of uses, ABLE account, we can use it for anything, housing and food, all of it. We can use it. It's not going to um, discount any SSI benefits. If we're if it's a special needs trust, though, technically we're not as of today. We're not supposed to use it for housing and food. Um, after September, we're not supposed to use it for housing, or it would reduce that SSI benefit. But again, if we have both, if we have the able account and we have the special needs trust, what we could do in this scenario is take $18,000 out of the trust, deposit it over into the ABLE account for the year. And now we freed up that 18,000 to use to offset housing and or food, right? If we need to, without impacting SSI. Um, taxability in an ABLE account, tax-free, which I, you know, I'm all about bargains. Like I said before, if we can get around paying taxes, that's a great thing. Um, in a special needs trust, unfortunately, there are no tax favors. So if the asset that you placed in the trust is going to create a taxable event, we're still going to have that taxable event. And it's possible it could be even accelerated in terms of the tax rate. That's a session I could do, like a three-hour session on just how taxes work in a special needs trust, but for another time. Um, but remaining assets... So here's a really important one. If I've bored you and you guys are asleep, this is a good time to wake up because this is important to know. In an ABLE account, if there's anything left in that account, one, in, when the child passes away, then Medicaid is going to have first rights to that. Now, again, this is going to be state specific. There are a few states where if you reside in that state, they have waived that rule. Um, but the majority of the states do still have that role where if there's anything left in, in the ABLE account, Medicaid's going to have first rights to that to pay themselves back, right? To keep that program going. So I get where they're coming from, but what we don't want to do is not understand that role, put a ton of money in there, you know, and then have a hundred thousand dollars that we lost because we didn't understand how that works. Right. So um, where I see an ABLE account working really well is really more for short-term money or pass-through money, right? If, we, if we're doing the 18,000 distribution so we can pay for housing, love that. Um, or in that example where grandma left $5,000 um, and we, we were in trouble for SSI, perfect, let's throw it into the ABLE account. Now we're back in business, right? So it's good as a place to you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not encouraging you to necessarily run out, open an ABLE account and start maxing it out each year. I don't think that's what you probably need to do. Um, but I do believe it's an important part of the plan that, you, that you'll likely want to have one. Um, and then, okay, special needs trust, 
If it's a third party trust, then you maintain control of where those remaining assets go. So um, you can leave it to other family members. You can leave it to a charity of your choice. You can decide where it goes um, if it's third party. So let me touch on that really quick. Third party means that the beneficiary, so our child, right, never received that outright. So they never, it never passed through their name. Remember that example I gave where the trust is established upon death. We have beneficiaries that are on our accounts that are already listed as the trust. And so it just goes directly to the trust. It never passes through the child, right? That would make it a third party. So someone other than the beneficiary owned the asset before it went into the trust. Um, that's what we want ideally. If it's a first party trust, which you may have heard before, um, that means it was the child's money at some point. They owned it, right? Um, so that example of grandma who left $5,000, let's say it was $50,000. Well, if it's $50,000, we can't put it in an ABLE account. Um, so if we want to try to get back in compliance for SSI and Medicaid, we would have to open what's called a first party special needs trust, um, which is great. We put the money there. We're back in business. Um, but now when that beneficiary passes away, Medicaid again is going to have rights to that money. So that's why we want to try to set everything up ahead of time if possible. Um, okay, last one, ease of access and enable account. Very easy. Like I said, a lot of um, state programs have those debit cards where you can use it right at the point of service. Um, in a special needs trust, it's not easy at all for the beneficiary to access funds. In fact, they can't. Legally, they're not supposed to ever receive a distribution from the trust. The trust would pay things directly, right? So let's say, um, let's say, let's get wild and let's say the beneficiary wants to take a trip to Disney. And let's say it's going to be $6,000 for the trip. Um, great, we can do that. But what the trustee would do is they would buy the flights directly. They would pay for the hotel directly. They would, you know, book the excursions directly, whatever it is. Um, it would never, they would never say, here, beneficiary, here's $6,000. Now you go do it. That would never happen, right? So it would have to go through the trustee. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, Recapping, because I know we're running out of time here. Again, we do believe that you would want to have a team. The three experts would be the financial professional, the government benefit specialist, and the attorney. Um, if you're already working with a financial professional, I would just say make sure that they do have some experience in the special needs part, that legacy piece. Um, if not, reach out to an advisor like myself or someone on my, in my you know national uh, study group who has that expertise and can help counsel at least on that one part, because that is going to be important for you all. Um, and then when you're developing your special needs plan, the first part you want to do is just understanding your current situation, your vision. I find as a parent with a kiddo with special needs, sometimes I'm just trying to get through the day. If you know what I mean, like we're just trying to get through the day, put some dinner on the table you know, get everyone to bed and then do it all over again. So it's sometimes hard to take the time to think about the future or to try to plan for it. But I would absolutely encourage you to do that and really think through what ideally do you want their future to look like? Um, and then get the benefits your loved one's entitled to. Again, I can't tell you how many times I meet with someone where their kiddos in their late 20s or 30s and mom and dad applied for SSI years ago, got denied the first time, got frustrated, and just never went back and reapplied. And so we've had all these years of money that was just being left on the table. So don't let that happen. Make sure you're getting those benefits that you're entitled to. Attempting to estimate the future cost of care, that's where we come in. Um, when we work with clients, we obviously do comprehensive financial planning, but helping you understand you know, in a truly worst case scenario, if something happened, how much needs to go into that trust so that your kiddo can have the resources they need? And then establishing and funding that special needs trust. Um, again, working with the attorney, the financial planner and tandem for that piece. I'm going to skip this slide just so we have some time at the end. Um, but where do we go from here? So if you were on today's call or if you even signed up for today's session, we're going to send you some tools 
Um, we have something called the special needs planning checklist, which is a really great tool. Again, no matter where you're at in the planning process, if you, if you like, oh yeah, I got the trust. Yep. Got the able. Yep. I know who my trustee is. You've done all of that. Great. I would still encourage you to take a look at the checklist because there may be a couple of things on there that you haven't thought of. Um, again, if you're at the beginning of the journey, it's a great template. So you have an idea of, of kind of all the pieces to touch on. We're also going to send you a fillable letter of intent. This is a great document to keep with your state plan. So with your wills and your trusts. And this is where you can put things about your child or your loved one that are specific to them. What foods do they love? What medications are they allergic to? You know, who is their doctor? What medications are they taking? All of the things that are very specific about your kiddo um, that would be helpful for a caregiver who might have to step into those shoes unexpectedly, right? So that's a really great one. Um, we're also gonna give you the Beyond One Day at a Time brochure, which touches on all of the topics that we talked about today, plus more. So if after today's call, you're thinking, wait, what was that? What was the difference again between SSI and SSTI? Don't even worry about it. It's going to be in that brochure um, so you can refer back to it. And then, like I mentioned, access to that ABLE analyzer. So we'll, we'll give you that tool as well. Um, and then last but not least, if you don't have a financial planner and you're thinking, wow, we really need that, love to help you. Um, we are offering everyone on this call a free financial plan. Um, there's no cost for it. And it would include that quality of life estimate for your child's that that trust funding strategy piece that we talked about so that you have an idea of how much actually needs to go in the trust. And then we'll help you figure out where's it going to come from, right? So if that's something you're interested in, just email me um, and happy to help you with that piece. But that's it. That's where I'm at. And I feel like we have one minute, but I'm happy to stay longer if you guys have questions. I'm, I'm here until you, until the questions are over. Will you also share a copy of the slideshow? Um, I can. I can certainly do that. But like I said, that brochure gives a lot of the detail. And I feel like it's more pleasing to the eye and gives more context. So, but I'm happy to do either way. We can do that. Okay. I appreciate that. Of course. Thank you so much for the information that you've shared. Um, I know you wanted to set some time towards the end uh, to talk about uh, family potentially moving to Florida. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if you wanted to, yes, um, if you. anyone has any other questions related to the information that was shared, um, we can go ahead and do that now. And then I would like to maybe stop the recording to um, get more thorough into that specific question. Okay, that sounds great. Um, do you want me to go ahead and answer the question about the Florida Sure. If, if, okay. If you're yeah. So someone um, messaged in and asked, or they said they currently live in California. They're considering moving to Florida and just wanted to know how benefits might be impacted. That's how I'm remembering the question. And so here's what I would say about that. Florida is about as good with their government programs as Texas, which is not great. If I'm being honest, there's just not a lot of funding there. A lot of times to get on the government programs, um, the waivers specifically, there's a long wait list. Um, also, there's not a lot of great um, waiver friendly residential options. So usually if you're looking for an independent setting, you would want to probably look more to the private pay options if you're moving to Florida. So all of that to say, um, if you're in a position where you're already set up and receiving really great support in one state and you're considering moving to another state, I would encourage you to reach out to a government benefits specialist. The one that comes to my mind, they're called um, National Care Advisors. They're a wonderful organization um, that can help you do a benefits assessment before you move. So they can help you figure out, you know, if you're trying to recreate what you already have going on where you are, in a new setting, what you need to do. And they can help you figure out what those wait times might be just to help manage your expectations. In addition to that, they can help you figure out what your residential options even are, right? So they can do a lot of that legwork for you. If you're looking for an independent setting, they can come to you and say, you know, based on what we're looking for, here's the 10 best options. 
And then it gives you a place to start so that you're not just shooting in the dark, right? Because I think that's a really hard position to be in is to move from one state to another and not have any connections, not know, you know, what resources there are. And so national care advisors, they're the best, in my opinion, um, for that. Yeah, we've made connections with national care advisors and really appreciate the services that they provide. Yes, they're they're one of the best for sure, if not the best. So um, that was a really great question. I'm glad that got brought up because we what have what I see happen more often than not is someone has a great setup and California is one of the best. You can move to California and get benefits same day, not technically same day, but pretty close. Um, and there's a lot of people moving from California to Texas and they get here and they're like, what? I have to wait 15 years to get what I was getting in California. Yep, you do. So just make sure you understand every state is run a little bit differently. Yeah. Thank you for that information. Um, I appreciate your time and the um, information that you've provided. If anyone has any additional questions, uh, feel free to email me. Um, I am Ruby. I've been the one sending the reminders. Mm -hmm. Um, I will follow up uh, with everyone um, with the tools and the handouts that will be provided as well as um, the recording once it is approved um, and ready to go. So thank you so Perfect. much to everyone for being here and I hope you all have a great rest of your Thursday. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye-bye guys. Bye.